Welcome back to Ultra Uncovered. This is a Fire Road episode, and we've got an awesome guest for you today. Zach is a, an endurance athlete uh, with Topo. He's a coach and a cert certified trainer, and he's got 10 years of ultra running uh, experience, at least on ultra sign up, with uh, wins, podiums, top finishes, and uh, results from all over the world, really. So, um, welcome, Zach. Really excited to have you here on the show. Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, excited to be a part of you know running uncovered, and uh, this will be uh, this will be great. Yeah, yeah, um, awesome. So, so <clears throat> go ahead, go ahead, Craig. Real quick, I was just gonna say something funny. So, Zach Marion, um, for those who don't know, Z A C Marion, uh, <laughs> on today, and just a funny story that Keep I went and did it. I went and did a treadmill um, hike right before this, and I turned on my treadmill, and who was staring at me? Zach Mary, <laughs> because it has iFit on it, and you've done a bunch of stuff with iFit. So I was like, well, this is, uh, this is ironic. There's Zach right on the treadmill. Very apropos. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. Well, you get to go trail running with me anytime you want. <laughs> That's awesome. This is true. This um, is true. Well, we've got you on today um, specifically because we're very interested in a new position and a new role that you've got with Aravipa as the live stream director. And for this podcast today, we'd like to kind of just break this down into, you know, maybe some technical questions about live streams, uh, some talk about like the future of live streams and your experience with it is really exciting in the sport right now and an awesome new way for people to uh, really follow along with races and have an understanding of what's happening uh at at these events and really get a good feel for, for how these events uh, operate more so than just maybe um twitter updates or you know uh, looking at results after the fact or or you know obviously um physically being there is kind of the the best scenario but there's fans of the sports all over the world and this is really bringing it to the forefront here so um I guess first off, can you describe to us um, how this position came about and um, kind of what your role with Aravipa will entail? Yeah, I mean, I think and it's funny. My partner Katie always talks about how like I, I essentially like created this role for myself and was like, "Hey, Jamil, you need someone to do this," and I, here's my resume for it. <laughs> um, and that kind of like kind of was the case. Like Jamil has been investing in this over uh, with Aravipa for a while and. Uh, mostly seeing the future and seeing what's going to happen. And yeah, like you said, there are fans all over the country, all over the world that want to see these races and they're fantastic races. And as the sport only continues to develop, especially towards the tip of the spear in terms of finishers, like the races are becoming more and more exciting. Every, like every single one is becoming a lot more exciting. So uh, with that, I think Jamil recognized that there are some opportunities to broadcast these. And it started, I think Western States was kind of one of the ones who really thought, you know what, we're going to do what UTMB is doing and we're going to try to, we're going to try to broadcast this in, in a big way. And really my involvement started there. Billy reached out, Billy Yang reached out to me and was like, Hey, could you like help out volunteer, like run some cameras, um, you know, follow the leaders, like chase them down. And, you know, I had a lot of fun doing that. Like, I didn't really think much of it other than this was just a really fun opportunity to literally run with some of my like peers and, um, you know, other fun athletes in the sport that I look up to and capture the excitement of the race up front. So it started just literally with an iPhone and a gimbal and running down Forest Hill, um, like 20 some odd times to capture like each runner as they came through. And, what year then, was that? You know, Dylan, uh, that was the very first year that they did the the broadcast. I want to say it was 20, 20 or 2021. I can't remember exactly. <laughs> uh, so I, after the pandemic? Yeah, I am positive okay. it was 2020. And, you know, it kind of started there. And then Dylan uh, Bowman over at Free Trail reached out a handful of months later, almost a year later for Gorge and was like, hey, do you want to do the same thing? But let's just broadcast it live on Instagram. Mm -hmm. And so we took turns broadcasting live for a few minutes at a time, chasing the runners and then giving like a prognostication of like what's happening and what we think is going to happen. 
And then I'd send it over to Dylan and then Dylan would catch the next part. And then I'd leap, like get in the car and leapfrog him. And then eventually Billy Yang asked me to come back and do more. And then it turned into me being a commentator uh, on course and not just running with the athletes, but like actually having a commentating role there. We worked that into it. And then all the while I was talking to Jamil and seeing what Jamil was doing. And I was like, he's, he's got something going on over there. I'm going to keep my eye on this. And as it grew, like as the opportunities grew with Billy and Dylan, and we continue to do this, I had gotten down with, with Jamil a couple times to run a couple races out there and help out with some friends. And I saw that he was flying drones and he was figuring out how to do the same thing. And he's obviously been a part of it. He had, has helped out at Broken Arrow, which is another one that I've been at and at Western States. And so he was kind of seeing what was happening and wanting to be a part of it, mostly bring it to his own races. Um, Cause that's kind of the only way that it was done is each race just individually did the whole production themselves. Um, so long story long, after a lot of conversations with Jamil and I was like, Hey, like this can go somewhere. Like this needs to be a, an entire production company. What you have is top notch, top level. And it kind of snowballed with him and he was like, I'm getting hit up by Hard Rock and Run Rabbit and all these other places. And he kept inviting me out to come and be a, a, a host and a commentator. And eventually I just, I chatted with him. It was at Run Rabbit this last year. And I was like, Jamil, like, you can't do this on your own. Like, I know you want to do everything on your own. And <laughs> he's got his hand in everything. I was like, you need help to make, take this to the next level. I have experience here. I know the business side of things. I understand what it takes to put on a broadcast. Let's look at what the future is for Steep Life Media, which is kind of the production company that we have uh, under Aravipa. And uh, after a few conversations, him and Matt were like, "You know what? Let's let's have a let's have a legitimate sit down chat um, and figure this out." And all the while, Jamil kept inviting me out to his races that he was broadcasting. He was like testing me. He's like. Hey, can you the, run this camera this over the there? Can you try it? Like, it was, it was an on-site interview. interview. And he's like, Hey, like sit back here and do some of this, like work the ATEM a little bit and do this. And I was like, okay, okay. I, I see what's going on here. Um, <laughs> and you know, I, I'm forever grateful to Jamil and Matt for trusting me with the opportunity of this position and taking the live stream opportunities that they have and, and legitimately creating more opportunities for other races to be involved in this. You know, it's Jamil is someone who I, I, I look up to immensely. And one of the things he always says is he talks about, he doesn't talk about his business in terms of, I have this money, I have these finances, I have these opportunities. He says it's a gift. He always talks about he, like he with Aravipa has been given a gift from the running community. And his goal is to constantly give back and support it however he can and these live streams and broadcasting these especially for the first year he was doing all of them at a loss he wasn't making any money doing any of them. he wasn't even breaking even he was spending thousands of dollars to do them um because he saw how it impacted the sport and mm -hmm. i am not only honored but i feel the you know the weight of that of i have to continue giving back in this role to the community and supporting these races the best way that we can so um it was with that mentality and the let's just figure this thing out and make it happen um that we decided to take a leap forward and create recreate mountain outpost which is where everything is happening it's not happening under aravipa it's happening under its own network the Mountain Outpost Network, and uh, yeah, we've got a lot of fun things coming down the pipeline. Yeah, I mean, obviously, there's like a, a natural alignment with Aravipa, but I mean, you guys are everywhere. You guys are, you know, help, helping support Big Alta. You're out at Hard Rock. I mean, there's all these, all these other ones that are like the fans of the sport want to see, and so. Um, how are you guys deciding like kind of, you know, what opportunities, uh, make sense? Is it just whatever is exciting and whatever, like, seems like it, it seems like the fans want, or how are you guys making those decisions? Honestly, it started off with just trying to like catch up to all the races that were reaching out to us and saying, Hey, we'd love for you to come do that at our race. Oh, um, sure. Could you, <laughs> could you do that? And that's how Jamil got hard rock. That's how Jamil got, um, run rabbit, run. Rabbit, run. And, uh, obviously like 
Avelina and Black Canyon and Cocodona, those are all his races or Air Vipa's races. And um, so it's been mostly like as races reach out to us, um, and there have been a large number of races who have reached out to us, we've continued to reach, you know, try to find a way to do this um, and work with each of these races in a way that that is we can provide what we need to provide um, and give them the best opportunity to be seen. And so, yeah, it's been a lot of reaching out to us. We've also had our eyes as we've sat down and built out what 2024 looks like. It was essentially, let's just try to do what is already in the pipeline and who's reached out to us. And then we have a 2025 and a 20 lineup of races that we'd like to see. And we're a little bit ahead of that schedule. I think we're in talks with a handful of races that we can't quite talk about yet. Um, there will be some announcements very soon about some one extremely large race here in the U.S. Uh, that we will be partnering with. Um, and again, we're back to a lot of really fun races. And our goal is always to do the races that are most meaningful to the sport. Like Jackpot Ultras might not be the most, the largest race, but it is a USATF 100 mile championship as yeah. well as like uh, Tussie Mountain Back is one that we're looking into because they are the 50 mile uh, championships, USATF championships, Desert Solstice. Not an exciting race to watch people run around a track for 24 hours. But again, it's a USATF championship race and it does have some meaning in the sport. So our first and foremost goal is always what's best for the sport. Our second goal is what is exciting to see and what do really at the end of the day, what do the users want to see? What is the end the end user really want to see? And our third goal is to not go broke. That's fair. It's totally fair. So um the big race that you're talking about, was that for twenty twenty four or is that beyond? That is a 2024 and beyond okay. race, and beyond. but okay. that one, yeah, that one will be announced shortly. I don't want to leak it here. I, I might be in trouble if I do, but <laughs> uh, it, it's a very Everyone large just... sport coming up this, this summer. Nice. I, I have a guess. Or, uh, which ones are public that are, that you guys are supporting in 2020? I think ones that are pretty well confirmed at this point. Um, obviously you guys saw Black Canyon, Jackpot and Big Alta. We will be out at Gorge Waterfalls. Gorge. Okay. Um, that one is another one that we're doing. Uh, Cocodona, we are for sure doing, um, Hard Rock. We are absolutely doing as well. And we are for sure doing, um, Run Rabbit Run. Mammoth Trail Fest is another one Ooh. we'll be doing. Avelina, of course, Avalina. Desert Solstice, Fat Ox. Those ones are absolutely for sure. I can say we are in conversations with a number of races right now and, and race directors. And I would like to see kind of the more competitive races uh, come to life. Because as you mentioned earlier, we used to look at a, t a Twitter feed and every couple hours, Brian Powell, yeah would yep. from iron far would throw up a hey here's one through five here's the splits male female and here's a grainy photo and you know so and so said everything's going great they looked good oh yeah, they looked like they were struggling yeah <laughs> that, that was as much as we got yeah and there's so much and and anyone who's been out there on the race course whether you're in the front of the pack middle of the pack or back of the pack there is so much more that's in between those, uh, you know, when you hit an aid station, you get like a, a, a race update to, that gets text out to your friends that, hey, they made it to this aid station at this time. There's so much story that happens in between those and in between Brian Powell's messages on I Run Far, there was so much to be told and we really want to tell those stories in the most exciting way that we can and you know, obviously the most exciting part is going to be the elite section of, uh, of the race. And due to a lot of constraints, particularly money constraints, it's hard to put a broadcast on and, and cover the fees for everything for 48 hours. You know, it's sure. rare that we can do that. So we try to bring as much excitement as we can, and we're trying to figure out ways to make sure that the middle and the back of the pack are also included but we've also heard a lot of feedback from people saying, we don't want cameras on us, like take this away. So it's been a really tricky, challenging thing to figure it out. Um, but I think we're trying to do it with uh, the respect of the runners as much as we possibly can, while also recognizing that, you know, we're never going to make everyone happy.
Yeah. Yeah. There was I, a lot. Go I was ahead, just going to say that. Yeah. That, um, well, first of all, I think I remember the first time I ever saw you, Zach, was when you were running at Gorge because we were there with a big group of like um, Castle Rock Run Club people. And I didn't know you at the time, but I there was just every aid station because I was crewing every aid station I was at. There's just this dude just flying, <laughs> like chasing people and back and forth and back and forth. And you were just like constantly out of breath. And then you're like getting in your car and going other, somewhere else. And yeah, it looked like it was a pretty, I mean, I've I've seen some of the you know, how many miles you guys cover actually following people because at a race like that, that was all the coverage. So like you were actually following people for a number of minutes and then going back and getting the next person and following them for a number of minutes. And like, there was some serious uh, athleticism going on in those. Um, but yeah, I was just going to say that. that it was some like, se serious intervals going on. Yeah. Yeah. I know it was, uh, I, I could tell for sure, but, um, but yeah, that, that was a question that came to mind. Cause obviously like you guys do follow and a lot of the live streams for the air viper races do go completely through to the very like end. And we, we just saw black Canyon happen and the hundred K like they finished, we finished streaming 30 minutes before the 60K started. Um, and so I guess that was the question is like, is it a, like you were mentioning, maybe an, a financial decision on which races you'll cover the entire thing? Is it up to the race if it's not an Era Viper race to help determine that? Or how do you guys think about kind of like what that coverage will look like race? To race? Yeah, so that is really up to the race director. Um Obviously, there are costs involved, and sometimes it doesn't make sense to try to keep everyone payrolled for a whole nother day when there really is no action going mm -hmm. on. Um, we can put up a like a finish line cam and get everyone coming into the finish line, and so we're we're trying to figure out ways. And really, it does it does ultimately depend on the race director for each race because. I am a producer and I reach out to the race and say, or they reach out to me and we make an agreement saying, I will do everything you ask me to do and we will put it on the Mountain Out Post Network and we will broadcast it to the world. But ultimately, they have all the creative say and the, the last say in everything that we do. So, like, you know, any Era Viper race, I can guarantee you that Jamil is going to say, we're going to see this thing through the very, very end. We did it with Run Rabbit. We'll do it with all of Era Viper's races. We're, we're going to do it with Hard Rock. Um, we're trying to find ways to be creative about it. And in truth be told is we don't have, you know, your big, big mystery here. There is no set way to do anything right now. <laughs> Nobody's done this. We're out here just wild, wild west in it and figuring out what sticks, what doesn't stick, what people really want to see, what they don't appreciate. Um, every single race that we do is an opportunity to learn more and continue to refine the process and make it better. Yeah. Is some of that feedback determined or like to the extent that you could explain to us kind of like how you evaluate, like what is landing and what's not, um, you know, is it viewership? Is it engagement in terms of kind of, you know, how active like the chat is or something like that? And um, anything that you can tell us about kind of like if you do a postmortem on these these events and figure out what you're going to do going forward. Every single race has a debrief and we go over it as a team, Matt, Jamil, myself, um, and we bring in some of the commentators and the hosts to see what went right and what went wrong on that side of things. So the technical side of things, all the behind the scenes things. Um, we look at a lot of the data that we get from um, our broadcast as to who watched what when um, and we go through and review it and we're like, Hey, what happened here that user engagement dropped off? Um, and, uh, also a lot of that data, we're very transparent with the race directors we work with. And we're like, if you want to bring this on an entire another day, it's going to cost X amount of dollars. And this is the engagement you're going to get from it. Mm -hmm. If the juice is worth the squeeze, go for it. You know, we're happy to do it, but we just want you to know that this is what it's going to be. Um, so there is a lot of metrics that we're looking at and figuring that stuff out. Um, and again, it's a lot of this. And I will say that one of the great things about Matt, Jamil, and myself is we have just a really great vision for things. And I think that just intuitively, we kind of get this in a, in a way that I've been in a lot of broadcasting little pods and communities and, and worked with a lot of different companies. And I will say that between Matt, Jamil, and myself, the three of us, we've we've got a, kind of a pulse on things, and I think we're doing something pretty magical over there. Um, 
in just the way that what I bring to the table, what Jamil brings to the table, and what Matt brings to the table, all the three of us really create something great. There seems to be kind of a couple different ways to bring that on course footage um, to the streams. And so there's like, you know, you've got, like you were talking about before, you know, somebody chasing with a camera, you've got uh, drone footage, you've got still cameras that are out there somewhere. What you do see in some of these UTMB productions and even at like Broken Arrow, I think is the the mountain bike following. Um, how, where are you guys in terms of like how you're diversifying between those things? I mean, some of it is just, some of it's obviously going to be permit based. There was a big talk about that at Big Alta, right? Like, oh man, we can't wait to get the drones at Big Alta. It's going to be great. But um you know, how are you guys looking at that and what do you see as kind of the direction moving forward there? Yeah. So really what people love are the drone shots. That's always yeah. our, that's our hero <laughs> shot, right? Like everyone loves a good drone shot. Um, and I think that that's great. You can only stare at the back of Jim Walmsley's jersey for so long <laughs> before you're like, okay, like this is just the I same thing or Courtney <laughs> DeWalter. I mean, I get it, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's, it's great to have that dynamic there boots on the ground. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's not really feasible. And that's one thing that we, uh, you know, another thing that we're doing with uh, Mountain Outpost is anyone that comes in, any any uh, field reporter, any volunteer cam runner, we're doing an education with them of like, your goal is to be not seen, is to be like, see, but not be seen and to capture things without getting in anyone's way. Mountain bikes are a very difficult thing to pull off on a lot of courses because it it obstructs the race that's happening. And, mm-hmm. you know, for example, uh, Karen, one of the times you saw me, I hardest thing I've ever done in my life was chase down Tyler Green and Ryan Miller at the finish of the 50K for um, uh, Gorge Waterfalls. I mean, they were ripping trail at like a low to high, like low six, high five minute mile. And like, I'm over there running with a camera, just trying not to fall on my face. Um, And I had to keep up with them for like a 5k. Like that's not easy to do, but I also had to respect that I was behind Tyler and Ryan Miller came up behind me. I can't obstruct the race in any way. It would be really difficult for Ryan to pass two people, um, especially if he was trying to be sneaky about it. Um, So I had to like sacrifice the shot, step out of the way get far enough back to let them race. Mm -hmm. Uh, So yeah, like mountain bikes, I think when we can use them, we have plans to use them, but they're just not as successful as uh, one would hope. Uh, The, what they're using at UTMB are a lot of e-bikes, which I'm sure if you've ever been on those mountains, you'd have to use an e-bike. But we have a lot of things in the works where, you know, it literally was just Jamil's messaging me right now. I can see the messages pop up on my phone about pieces he's looking at to integrate the GoPro data and literally making backpacks that have pep links that are using T-Mobile and Verizon dual bandwidths. Like we're getting the best cell service. We're doubling the cell service and they come with their own batteries and their own antennas that we're putting on them. Um, And then they're connecting that to their GoPro and they're running with them. So we're, we're doing a lot of things to try to bring as much technology to this as possible. That's, that's feasible. And that makes sense. Um, and you know, drones are always going to be the preferred shot. Uh, and then the still cams are great during races like, uh, you know, looped races, things like that. We're going to use a lot of still cams because we get such great crisp footage from that. Um, and we're always going to try to get a, a really good 6K uh, footage uh, still cam at the finish lines of, of every race we possibly can, because that's, everybody's special moment. They deserve that moment and to be seen. And so we do our best with trying to bring, you know, put a steel cam up high to overlook the, uh, the finish line. So every single runner gets that footage. Yeah. Okay. I have a question. So are there, is there any piece of equipment that you guys know is out there right now that you think is, would, would really significantly like change the game in ultra running live streaming that maybe we haven't incorporated yet or we're yeah I, that you could share i mean if it's <laughs> uh, i don't know if and i don't and also i don't know if there's ever you know do you en- ever envision a day where where runners actually have a camera you know in their glasses or on their hat or something like that so that there can be 
you know, this runner's perspective, like this is, and now we're going to go to what, you know, Courtney is seeing as she is, you know, in this part of the race, like she thinks she's hallucinating and she's (laughs) not. (laughs) Yeah. Uh, Yeah. I mean, there are, I think there's a lot of really fun things that can happen in the near future. I mean, people are out there walking around wearing VR goggles and, and, you know, like things are going to happen with technology. I think it's only a matter of time, you know, to bring it into perspective five years ago, we would have never anticipated that we could get Starlink satellites that would be able to broadcast a race in the middle of nowhere. Like these places are remote that we're going. They are seldom do they have the, the bandwidth we need to be able to do a, a high quality production broadcast, but thanks to Starlink, we have that opportunity. Now we can go out to red star um, Ridge at, uh, at Western States and put a, put a, a drone in the air, put a still cam there and have some footage in the middle of nowhere. Um, You know, I think almost all of the Western States course has like zero coverage whatsoever, but they're finding a way to do it. And so I think things like that are going to be happening. We did joke uh, when I talked to Billy Yang last year about doing Western States again. Uh, he was like, do you ever want to run it? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. And he's like, well, just so you know, as long as you're doing this for me, I'm not going to let you in the race. Like, I will make sure your number does not get pulled. Uh, and I was like, Jamil, I'll just run with the GoPro and we can have footage like from the middle of the pack. I promise you, it'll be great. Well, you but, know, uh, I don't feel like anyone knows what the course looks like between the escarpment and 50K. It's like that you you get all the escarpment shots and then you start getting like the shots at 50K and like the the dirt roads and then obviously everything from you know, everything from uh, Michigan Bluff in you get. But I don't feel like people know what the course looks like up there. There are a few hundred people who who get that experience every single year. And having been there before, it's. It's an incredible backcountry. Permitting does not allow filming of any type. We oh, wow. cannot put a drone in the air. We cannot. We can't even run with a GoPro yeah. and broadcast it. They will not allow that whatsoever. So permitting is yeah. another hurdle that we're trying to to work with. I've uh, recently had conversations with, uh, and this one I can talk about because it's just conversations. Um, Leadville. They will not allow a drone or a photographer outside of, I think one, the race gets one photographer that can stand at Hope Pass. And oh, they're, wow. we put in the permits and we're like, they're like, how, like, how big is the footprint? And we're like literally one square foot that we're standing in. That's it. And like, pack it in, pack it out. We're not going to leave anything behind. And they were like, yeah, no, we're not going to allow it. So, you know, we're, we're dealing with a lot of those hurdles, which is talking to, these you know forest services and saying hey like a special use permit is there for a reason it's a special use permit it's not something that we want to take advantage of but we also believe that it's important to have this it would showcase the area the land like it would you know we can do it respectfully and responsibly so that is something but as far as technology i mean we are in the midst of creating a lot of our own technology to make these things work which is a blast uh but Man, I really, I would love to see like a blimp that can just sit up there in the air for hours and just like take extremely amazing zoomed in shots of everyone. That would be fantastic. But uh, I don't know. I can't think of anything off the top of my head that is going to be game changing. But I think that that oh. blimp has already been drawn and uh, named right from Co- was, was that the, was that a Coca Dona right uh, outcome? Was that air of Ipa blimp? Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah, awesome. yeah, that was the the air of IPA, um, which is pretty rad. Uh, but yeah, I mean, technology is constantly changing, and you know, if if five years ago we thought it was a pipe dream to have uh, our own Starlink satellites out there, and now that's, I mean, we have five to eight of them that we're using at every race, mm-hmm. like. Yeah, more is going to come down the road. It's only a matter of time. Yeah, I think I remember. Um, it must have been like two or three years ago when we were talking about the Starlink thing and, and Jamil's like, I've got it pre-ordered. It's been on pre-order for like six months or something like that. And there wasn't even one. And now like fast forward, you know, whatever, 18 months and you have as many as you have of them. And um, so, yeah, we're always kind of looking for that. Um, 
So I guess we, we have a couple more kind of just technical questions. Um, could you tell us a little bit about kind of some of the key roles? Like how many people does it take to put this stuff on? And I have been in that, you know, setup and seen the cables and I've seen you guys breaking down and I've, you know, I've seen kind of how much literal equipment it takes. Um, can you talk a little bit about kind of, are there a couple of key roles that you like, we've got to have this covered in order to be able to put this on and then extras are just helpful or how do you guys um, organize kind of the, the, the team that's going to put it on? Yeah. First thing I do is I take a look at, after having the conversation with the race director, um, I'll take a look at the Cal, I'll build a Cal Topo map of the race and figure out where we can fly drones, where it's legal, where it's not legal, where we need permits. Um, and that helps me decide the drone team. And then I look at like the aid stations and, and kind of go through the history of the course and what times we expect to see people come through. And that helps me develop the field team. Um, and then there's always, you know, depending on how long the broadcast goes, we have our host and commentating teams. So, um, We'll need, you know, Corinne, you've been in that seat before. I've been in that seat. We've got AJW. We've got Chris Warden. We've got Corinne Malcolm, Dylan. We've had so many people fill that role. Um, and we're always open to seeing who else can do this. Well, there's no set team. We want to build like a portfolio of people that can come and do this all over the country. So if anyone's listening and they're interested, hit me up, Zach at Viper. Shoot me uh, a Gmail or an email. And uh, I would I would love to to get more people on board. That was a shameless plug. Outside of that, uh, yeah, we've got our volunteer runners who are always out there running around with cameras and gimbals and you know that's super helpful. Um, as far as the core team, it's generally hosts, field reporters, drone operators that are licensed drone operators and our camera team, we have to have several camera guys and audio techs and then our I'm I'm usually the director. Me, Matt, or Jamil are usually the director, as well as we kind of swap roles of who's going to be video producer, who's going to be studio producer, who's going to be field field producer. Um, there's generally about eleven to eighteen of us that will show up at any given race. Um, so it's not a not as big operation, but it's not small. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's a lot of us that are you know showing up a day beforehand, and we're all carrying multiple roles and putting multiple feathers in our cap, um, for different jobs that we do. And, you know, like I'm not an AV guy. I, I know the business and I know how to run a production, but I don't know all the technical equipment, but that's something I'm learning a lot of over the last couple of months as I'm out there every day, like hooking stuff up, connecting things together, running through the, the systems and learning it. So you know, one thing I do love and respect about Era Vipa and, and Jamil and what we're doing with Mountain Outpost is he's got this everybody just figure it out kind of attitude as a boss. And he's like, I, we're fail until we don't anymore. <laughs> and I love that attitude because it gives me an opportunity to learn so much more than just coming in and doing, you know, my director job. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun. So we don't have a huge team. We'd like to see that team grow. If anyone's interested in being a field reporter or a, a commentator, please hit me up. Awesome. No, I'm already awesome. signed up for Cocodona and I, Hard Rock, I do so love... I'll, be, I'll be helping with those. You know, you're, you're on my list already. Yeah. Go um, ahead, you, you mentioned that the kind of the race director gets to kind of determine like, hey, what does what the content look like? One of the things that I really appreciate about your broadcast is that you do make a concerted effort to have that um, equal coverage between the top of the fields on the men's and the women's side. So I'm guessing that that's like a a core value that you're not willing to um, negotiate with in terms of in terms of what the race director wants. But talk a little bit about some of the challenges of that um, and then how you guys, you know, are are you guys keeping track of that? Are you guys like, oh, we've talked about the men for 10 minutes. Let's, you know, or is it just like a feel thing? Like, how do you how do you do that? You you know, I, I do think that the the team does a great job of like splitting that up, but I, you know, and it has to be conscious uh, to, to do that. So can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So basically what we do beforehand is we have what we call a run of show. That is every five minutes, this is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to talk about. This is what we anticipate. M1 will be here. F1 will be here. Um, and it is a challenge, especially on a point-to-point -point course. 
we almost have to double our video videographers and drone team because at some point there inevitably becomes a decent separation between the top men and top women, unless it's Courtney DeWalter and she's like top 10 at Western States, whatever. Um, like there is inevitably to give everybody that 10 deep, five to 10 deep, depending on the race coverage, we have to split up our team a little bit. And sometimes our team just doesn't have the ability to check in with the women while we're broadcasting the men and vice versa. We just don't have eyes on men when we're broadcasting the women. So it comes down to, we try to be very conscientious about it. And we like the, it's the director's job to constantly be monitoring what video feed we do have and updating the team, the broadcast team of, Hey, we've got eyes on F1. Uh, let's cut to that as soon as we can. And we communicate that to them. They hear it in their ears or they see it on the screen and they're like, ah, we need to transition to this. Um, I mean, it's a pretty, it's a pretty involved, uh, like I would call it, it's, it's, it's like a symphony. Everybody mm-hmm. needs to be doing the exact, like hitting that note exactly at the right time, doing the right thing. And then they play off of each other. I would say it's less of a symphony, more like jazz. It sounds beautiful when you're listening to it, but it is also chaos at the same time. And everybody's playing off of everyone else. So jazz is probably the more appropriate, uh, musical reference there, but uh, yeah, there's, there is a concerted effort to be like, Hey, we don't run a stopwatch and say, this is what's happening with the men. Okay. Click it off. And now let's go to the women, but we do whatever we can see. And when, if we feel like, Hey, we've been focusing on this a lot, let's try to cut back to what's going on over here. And we'll communicate with our team in the field and say, do you have any information yet? If we're not talking about the men, uh, then maybe we send a field reporter to go talk to one of the you know top five women's crew that's sitting there and interview them and say, Hey, like, how's Keely Henniger doing out there? You know, she's, she was in third place. How's she feeling? Um, you know, that kind of stuff I think is really important. And we don't want to, you never want to beat one drum too much. Uh, you know, like, again, some of us might not mind following Jim Walmsley all day. Um, not that many of us can, but, uh, you know, we also want to make sure that everybody's getting the attention that they really deserve. And that's ultimately what brings up the sport. You know, we were using this as an opportunity to put more eyes on the sport and more eyes on the individual athletes because it helps them, uh, more eyes on the race. It helps the race grow more eyes on the sport helps the sport grow because people are excited about what's happening in trail running. And I I think we do our best to try to try to capture all the story that we can throughout the day and not just focus on one specific theme. Yeah, it's yeah, the story, think- <laughs> but it's also the vibe of the race and what's going on. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's such a participatory sport. And like we see that in how active like the chat is and that we have other, you know, commentators and people that are so well known in the sport that are like jumping into the chat and and interacting and correcting. And, you know, you've got your expert here and there, like, um, you know, it's a station fireball will be in there throwing stats and like it's so participatory too, that I think that that is really helpful. And like, I don't know, just kind of making it feel like everybody is, is a part of it. So, um, it's, it's cool. It's That's really a really cool. fun dynamic of what we're doing is that it is so participatory. And yeah. this is something that hit me like a light bulb a little while back in the sport is running and specifically ultra running is the only sport I know of that recreational, elite, professional, sub-elite, all toe the same line at the same time. And for, if you can keep up, for the first little while, you can run with a professional athlete next to you. In any major marathon, elite corral has a five-minute head start on all the sub-elites. And you're not lining up next to Ilya Kipkoji. You're not going to be next to any of these amazing athletes, but in trail running, we are. And in fact, we participate on the exact same day on the exact same course with the exact same results roster as our professional athletes. And Mm -hmm. so it is an interesting dynamic that it is fun. And we get to have people like Liam who are chatting up a storm during the whole thing and bringing all the best data that you could possibly want. Um, and so many others. I don't want to just focus on Liam at A Station Fireball, but there are so many that participate in this. And that's what makes this sport a lot of fun and really exciting. 
Um, also a challenge because uh, there are a handful of middle of the pack, back of the pack runners who are like, you know what, I'd rather not see a drone in the air and I would rather not see a camera in my face. But they're not understanding that this is also the elite end of the sport. And if you, I mean, you don't get to see your little league teams go play with the MLB, but you know, in this sport you do. And so on, it's like, it's a, it's a really delicate balance of us trying to respect everyone, but also capture the excitement of the sport, but also capture the spirit of the sport, which mm -hmm. is the middle and back of the pack runners. And I can tell you right now, looking at the data, one of the strongest parts of the live stream for Western states is golden hour yeah. every year. It's yeah. one of the, the start male finisher, female finisher, and golden hour. Those are your four most important times of the broadcast. And uh, having been there, and I'm like literally getting goosebumps now just thinking of golden hour. It's my favorite part of the entire race. But, you know, like that's, it's an extremely compelling story and it's it deserves to be shared with the world. Yeah. Um, and I'm ultra running is awesome and that it's the only sport where you get, you get both the excitement of the sport and the spirit of the sport in the same race. Yeah. I'm, I'm super excited because I get to go to Western States for the first time this year with the company I'm working with. And I was You're looking at it. flights and I was literally like, okay, we are not leaving until late evening on Sunday because we are going to golden hour. And I'm going to show all of you guys that are like more embedded in the cycling triathlon world. What, what a golden hour is like, like, and I'm, and I'm super excited to see it. Like it's going to be one of my favorite parts of the whole, the whole trip. But um, yeah, it's, it's so cool. We, we've got some really uh, exciting things happening with uh, the Western States finish line feed this year that there mm -hmm. will be some great coverage of it. Um, we've struggled with years in the past with the, you know, the GoPros and gimbals just not getting that great of footage. Um, there's like a really weird dead spot from Roby Point to the finish line that uh -huh. like no cell service can survive. It like... Huh dies instantly. I think this year we've got some fun things figured out to hopefully bring a lot of that more to life, at least in the broadcast. But Corinne, come find me at the finish line during the golden oh, hour yeah. and you and I can just hold each other and weep <laughs> just tears of joy and inspiration and excitement I'll bring as my, I'll bring those my final box five of, minutes tick by. Yeah, no, I'll bring my box of Kleenex for sure. We can, we, it, we can do it for sure. It's um, so it's is so good. Is Western States a mountain outpost production, the the live stream of it, or is it something different? Uh, it it's might be potentially. <laughs> it could be. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, I played the fifth on this one. Uh, okay. okay. No, I will say it contracts are in. It's going to happen this year. There has been no okay. official announcement yet. Uh, Billy Yang and Jamil are working on that. You'd probably see it within the next couple days. So maybe by the but time we, this comes out, it'll have been announced out. and I won't lose my we, job. Yeah, no, we, we, <laughs> we can, can edit. We have the ability to do that. <laughs> it was more, I was just no, curious. No, that, is, that like, is a really big. Go ahead. Sorry, I'll, I'll finish this, that, that thought. It's a, that's a really big, exciting thing for us is uh, we are teaming up with Western States this year, and it is going to be a unforeseeable future thing between Mountain Outpost and Western States. That was something that we literally had just signed and gotten taken care of. Jamil and I were at Jackpot 100 and had a call with everyone at Western States, and we were both just like staring at each other like, is this is this happening? Is this, is this for real? And so it's, it's a huge honor. It's a huge task. It's a huge responsibility. And we're doing our best to tell the best story we can there and share all the stories that we possibly can. But uh, yeah, we're having oh, cool. conversations every single week with the Western States board and uh, we're, we're making some fun things happen. Heck yes. So, Ooh, so look okay. into the future so you heard it, a little you bit. You heard it how, here first. So look at look into the future a little bit. Like, how do you envision fans of the sport um, kind of consuming the the live stream right now? Personally, what I do is I I turn it on live, but it's like I'm I've got it throughout the day. I may pause it, and I'm like I don't want to miss anything. So I'm like watching what's happened in the past, like you know, in in like an hour ahead. It takes me all day to get through a six hour live stream, but I want to hear everything that's happening. Um, so 
Um, but I, I see that. And then I've seen like, you know, big screens at like uh, Forest Hill or something like that, where it's like, oh, okay, people can watch it. You know, fans of the sport that can watch, follow along the whole time there. Like, how do you envision fans consuming and and watching uh, in the future? You know, honestly, my, my goal, um, besides director of live stream media, my other unofficial title is managing the Mountain Outpost Network and trying to grow that out. I want it to be the ESPN of trail running. I want more than just live streams. I want um, gear review shows. I want, you know, like talking head shows. There are so many things that I want to do and produce and not just through our own production company. We think of it like Netflix, they do their own movies, but we also, there's also a lot of classics mm -hmm. that are on there mm -hmm. and new movies that are on there. So yeah. we want to build out the mountain outpost to be, the place for trail and ultra running media and visual media sorts, specifically some might say. Um, you know outside on outside does a great job an outpost of sorts exactly so that's we are trying to reframe what mountain outpost is it is going to be a broadcast network and not just a channel or you know everyone really from back in the day will associate it with jamil's you know <laughs> kind of parody type show which is great <laughs> Which that might no, come no, back. House? We don't know yet. We, yeah. or, or Jamil and, and Skylar doing weird challenges or something, right? <laughs> Always so exciting. So there's, a lot of, there's a lot of fun stuff we want to do with it um, and bring it to life. But our hope is that these live streams, obviously we'd love it if we produced something that got put onto ESPN, right? Like that's, that's the dream goal. But our sport, we are not able to distill a 24-hour race down to a hour to two hour uh, production. Um, mm -hmm. We just can't. So we, until that happens and until we find ourselves on like ESPN Ocho, uh, we are going to be out of the Mountain Outpost broadcast network. It will be predominantly streaming on YouTube just because it's the easiest way to do it. It's free. If we were to put it behind a paywall on a website, we don't want to do that. Uh, that is the last thing we want to do. We want this to be everyone to have access to it. Um, so it will be on our YouTube channel. We're going to build out the network, have a ton of shows on there, a ton of excitement. Live streams are absolutely going to be the core of it. Um, but we love to see people digesting it in little bits if they can, popping on, popping off, streaming the whole thing. Like it's, we love it there because it's there for anyone to watch whenever and however they want. It, it lives there in perpetuity and it's not going anywhere. So when I go home to Salt Lake City and want to show my parents this race that I was in and, and this section that you could see me in, I can go hop on the computer real quick, pull up YouTube and show them the 30 second clip of me crossing the finish line or me at the race, like, or show them even what I'm doing when they're like, you know, every parent and cousin and neighbor is like, Oh, you do it all in one day, like a whole hundred miles. Like, what do you do? You stop and eat. Typical you questions. Be like, you, no, look, this is what we do. This is what we do out there. Look how beautiful this was. This was amazing. So we hope that people are using it for that purpose to bring more of awareness and an excitement for the sport um, on top of seeing the competitive edge of it. That's exciting. Um, and yeah, we, we, you know, Jamil has invested in a huge, huge LED screen that we're going to have dropped off at, you know, middle of the race so that people can watch that. That's twofold. We love people watching that so that they're not streaming it on their phones and eating up all of our bandwidth so that yep. we can't broadcast it. It's for your own benefit. Um, so if we can have it on the, in the location, in the location, mm -hmm. you're allowed to watch yeah. it elsewhere in the, in the, in the country. <laughs> yeah. If you're at forest Hill and you see that screen, go, go watch the screen with a bunch of friends and enjoy it. Like we want to see that happen and it frees up the bandwidth for us to give you a better picture at the end of the day. So it, everyone wins uh, when we do that, but yeah, we're, we're investing in some things like that so that we can hopefully make it just more exciting. I mean, imagine being at the rut and being at, or broken arrow and being at, the base and watching the vertical K from the giant LED screen that's sitting at the finish line slash start line. And you can see the entire VK from drone footage and runner footage. Like that's the stuff yeah. that we envision happening. It's going to be amazing. It's like matching what Mount Marathon gets to do with their local coverage. And you see the entire race because you just watch it from a helicopter, the entire thing going up and down. It's like, yeah, you see the whole thing. That's great. And, I, you know, another thing that like I, I love seeing is like I want the whole six hours, but 
sometimes in that six hours, you've got grainy footage, you've got whatever. It's like, I also love like the post-produced like five minute clip of like, oh, we caught this runner. And, and that stuff is like perfect footage because now you're taking the raw data, you're converting it. It's all post-production, looks amazing. It's like, I love all that stuff too. Yeah, we're gonna be doing a lot of that in the, the near future. I think that that's kind of the next phase is bringing these post-produced pieces that are like, here's the amazing, like, here's the fight that went down out there in 10 minutes, yeah. you know, like imagine watching, you know, Rachel Drake and, um, uh, Becca Wendell. Oh, what was her name? Be Becca. Becca Wendell. Thank you. Uh, Becca Wendell battling coming, the, coming out of the, the last, <laughs> coming out of the river. And there was like that little slip and moves were made. And it's just yeah. like, oh my gosh, this is the amazing part of the sport. And being someone who's been on the competitive edge of the sport at times, like I saw what happened in between those updates. And like, that's what I envision bringing to people. Like, I don't think people understand how competitive it is up there and the games that get played at the front of the pack. Like, you know, I, I'll never forget. I ran, uh, one of the first iterations of Uray 100 against Courtney DeWalter, who neither of us at the time were a name in the sport whatsoever. And we're running and I'm like, who is this chick in silver basketball shorts? Like literally starter basketball shorts chasing me yep. down. Um, and I had to play like some games with her. Like I left the last aid station and we were neck and neck. And I sprinted off, turned a corner, knowing that I was going to get into the woods here soon, turned my headlamp off. And so she had nothing to chase. And I, I kept, I took away that carrot that, you know, she kept chasing me down. I took it away from her. And I just, I literally went the rest of the night off of moonlight and it was a calculated risk. And like, it worked, you know, like I can say I am one and oh against the great Courtney DeWalter. And I don't know a lot of guys that can say that. Um, <laughs> There's not that many. So that's my only claim to fame these days. Yeah. Or, or so like, I, mean, I think about... there's only what, five yeah, talking about Western states, like think about Sorry. if we had footage of the, you know, the Claire um, Gallagher and Brittany Peterson, you know, passing right there at the with with the last like whatever, you know, at that last aid station and the the bottles of Coke flying and like there's their flasks and stuff like that. Like there wasn't there were a couple of photos, grainy photos, and then we just have the stories. But if if there had been footage of that, I can't wait to bring that to the world. And that's what at Mountain Outpost, our whole focus is, is we want to bring those exciting stories to the world. And I mean, another story that I would have loved to have watched is uh, Gunhild with Rob Carr leaving Roby Point with like a few minutes to spare and makes it under the cutoff in the golden hour in the final like seconds eight eight seconds of the race like sneaks it in like imagine if we had coverage of rob Carr out there like with her like come on gun help like yeah let's go let's do this like get like he's out there in his flip-flops you know like having just won it the day before um things like that that you know we have stories and lore and these these tales but we don't have like like Visuals. I can just see it. Like that'd just yeah. be so much more rewarding. And that's what we want. That's what Mountain Outpost. Yeah, that's incredible. You've, you've talked a little bit about like what you see uh, maybe in the future, but do you have any other like big pie in the sky dreams um, for live broadcast? Say like, you know, Corinne brought the prompt, like put, put us 10 years in the future. What does this live stream look like at the uh, 2034 Havelina? Oh gosh, that's so insane to me just because like... I'm trying to wrap my head around. Sorry, I keep losing my phone here. Uh, I'm trying to wrap my head around like a few year, a few years down the road, like two years down the road is like all my brain can handle right now. Uh, so to to pull back and look at you know ten years down the road, uh, I know there's going to be so many great advancements in the technology and in the capacity and the ability to go into these places that have zero cell service and like really not a ton of ability to broadcast much without, you know, stationary star links and then having to move that down and reset it up. I would envision us being in a place where we can capture crystal clear footage in a hundred K, whatever they have at that point. Uh, I would love to see that. And uh, I think that it really is only a matter of time before we have that ability to just stream anywhere and everywhere at crystal clear um, bandwidth. But 
Um, you know, that's something that we can hope for in the future. Um, longer we all go battery sit life. In IMAX theaters and watch it. <laughs> <it's that laughs> I mean, <good. laughs> I, my goal and my hope with what Mountain Outpost is able to do is able to bring the sport to a place where, you know, I liken it to, um, you know, the, the mixed martial arts or UFC. I was used to be a huge UFC fan back in the, you know, late tooth, early teens. And, you know, that sport was a pretty fringe sport. It was something that like not a lot of people did, um, you know, broadcasting it and pay-per-viewing it was awesome. And then they would get like a breakthrough and they were able to show a couple smaller events uh, locally. And, you know, you'd see them on your local you know, networks and, you know, now it's a mainstream sport and it, it's because people were able to fall in love uh, with their heroes and are able to see the true competition of the sport. And it's not just a blood sport, you know, where two people are just going crazy on each other. It's not a bar fight. There's a lot of technicality to it. There's discipline. There's so much that goes into these MMA fights and the world didn't know until they were able to see it. And and then you bring in the storytelling and you bring in the excitement of that. And where I would like to see broadcasting go and live streams go in the future is I think there is a legitimate place for us amongst ESPN and some of these other great networks where the sport just captures, you know, we all know the sport has so much story in it. That's why we're here. We love the stories that are told that we create ourselves, that we hear about from others. We see others undergo when we're crewing and pacing. You know, there are amazing stories and an, and an even better community behind this sport that I think if the world gets to see it, uh, I think I think they're going to catch on. I think they're going to latch on to the sport and they're going to see what, what we all see, what we already know exists. They're going to get to see it for themselves all around the world and people like my parents who will never be runners and never be a part of the sport will get to appreciate it for what I appreciate. Yeah. And I think there's been some, you get you know, little glimpses of that. Yeah. That's sure. exactly what I was going to say. Little glimpses of that. You know, I think of the, I think of the Netflix um, documentary about what's his name, Brian's or Briny Jeffrey. It's called once is enough. Right. Um, excellent. Um, documentary on Netflix and it's about him wanting to run a hundred and his whole story. And it's like, man, that thing, if you, it didn't matter if you were, if you're a runner, it resonated with you. It was super profound. It was so emotional. And um, it's just, that's just one. And I was thinking too, you know, yes, to your point of like, we can't condense it down right now into an hour or two hours, but that's kind of the beauty of it is that if you're streaming for you know, 12 hours, you have a lot of time to tell a lot of stories about a lot of people. And, you know, if there could be some kind of, you know, preamble or pre-recordings or interviews and things that kind of bring in the stories, it's like, and we have a little bit of time. So we're going to, we're going to go and talk about, you know, this group of uh, this local run club that's out here doing this. And three of them that are running a their first hundred K and, you know, one of them has DNF their last race and they need to try to figure it out this time. And like, here's their stories and this is what they do. And this is their families. It's just like, those are people just like me. Right. You know? So, um, it, I, I do think there's a lot of opportunity just to, to tell all of those stories. That is, that is coming down the pipeline. I can promise That's you awesome. that there are a lot of stories you want to tell and that aren't told just by watching elites race. Uh, yeah. You know, you can't really see someone's story just watching them at a finish line. And that's kind of exciting when you see each runner come through and you're like, what's their story? Like, what are they going through? You know, the the golden hour. What what was their day like out there? What did they go through to get there? And, yeah. you know, it's, it's our hope to be able to bring those stories to life and, uh, you know, some pre-recorded content might be going up at Western States. That's something nice. we're working on. Can't guarantee it yet, but it's things that we want to do because we see that there's so much more to tell. And, you know, like Unbreakable, the 100, uh, mm -hmm. the Western States 100 movie that was made back in 20, you know, a, a huge race and distilling it down to just an hour and a half to mm -hmm. almost two hours. But it focused on three runners, four runners. Mm -hmm. And that was it no female content on there whatsoever and definitely no middle or back of the pack content. I guess it focused on five if you count Gordy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a place for that, that, that there's a place for that in the sport to have these yeah. distilled down, like really fun, competitive, like 
I want to watch this. I want to watch this person's story on that. And that's what the Mountain Outpost Network is going to be. That's our future hopes for the Mountain Outpost. Uh, but as for the live streams, like we've just found it best to record the whole thing and let the whole day play out. And then maybe we pick some footage at the end and put splice it together to tell whatever story we can. But also like it's every runner's opportunity to look through that and watch, you know, their, their day, literally their race on YouTube. It lives there forever. They can watch it whenever they want. Well, and for Western States, you're looking at some of these people, the everyday runners might be waiting five, seven, 10 years to get into this race. And it, it's, you know, it's a, yeah, we're, we're all pointing to ourselves. I, I'd love to run <laughs> yeah. that race before I turn 50. So, <laughs> you know, you just got to keep applying. You'll, you'll get there. Um, but I mean, to your point before, where some people didn't want that attention, it's like, okay, well, you know, that's not a story you tell then. Like, there's mm -hmm. going to be people that, you know, are willing to share their stories. Yeah. 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 We have some like things in, in, in mind that we can do for that, where maybe before every race, we send out a small YouTube clip that just says, hey, like, here's a sign. If you do not want us to film you, we can't keep track of everybody's number and reference it and color code bibs and all that's too complicated. But if you do not want us to record you, give us a sign that says you don't want that. Here's, you know, like whatever sign that says no. And, and we'll cut away respectfully. We're not going to also, we're also not going to like hover our drones over the porta potties at an aid station and just like watch people go in and out. Like we're going to try to be as respectful as we can with these things. It um, might be important even though the porta potties, you know, it's, sometimes there's a lot of action that can happen in there. So-and-so is in the porta potty yeah. for 30 seconds. Um, so yeah, it's Jim Walmsley lost eight minutes in the porta potty. You know, like everyone wants to know that. <laughs> you know, and it's you know we're doing our best to like be as respectful as possible and whatnot. But uh, but yeah, like for those who don't want it, they don't have to be involved in it, and we're going to give them an opportunity not to be. Um, but when was the last time you went to a marathon and said, "I don't want a photographer"? on course like i'd rather not see yeah. a photographer I, or shoot. like yeah it's going to be the exception yeah yeah it's it's in there and when they sign the rights to the race they are signing saying like the race can use these like they're going to have photographers out there and the races can use these photos for their own you know whatever um you know, everybody signs that and it's same with the live stream. They're signing that as well. So, you know, we'll do our best to stay out of everyone's way. We're not going to disrupt anybody's race. We're not going to, obviously, if somebody is puking in a bucket, we're not going to be like, let's get zoom in on this. Uh, you know, your weakest, most vulnerable moment. Let's watch you ball your eyes out in this aid station. Like, no, we're going to be as respectful as we can. Um, and it's not going to be as intrusive as I think people might think it will be. You know, we just, we want to try to tell the stories that need to be told that are worth telling. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. So okay. what do you think about getting into some uh, rapid fire questions? Yeah, we just have a, a, a couple yeah, of rapid fire. let's do it. Let's do it. A couple of rapid fire. But before we do the rapid fire um, questions, we have to on air invite you. Are you coming to the Castle Rock Gala, the Ridgeline Revel Gala this end of April? <laughs> You're formally invited. And we, we since we have no sponsors on this podcast, we're going to plug our own <laughs> event <laughs> that's happening. Heck yeah. So, I love yeah. it. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, I, I love seeing that invite. Um, it's something that if I am in town, uh, I will absolutely be to. I think it's worth going to. Um, sports a great cause, great community. Of course, I'll be there. Awesome. Thank Corinne, you. give them the date. and Yeah, uh, April, what... yeah April 27th. Corinne, you want to give them the date? And what... The Castle Rock Run Club is hosting a running gala. So this is the coolest event because you get to eat. And drink both alcoholic and non and non alcoholic beverages will be available, um, but you get to dress up like as fancy as you want, and yet you get to wear running shoes. Like that's our requirement for this event. So um, it's the first year we're doing it, and we okay, are okay. trying we're trying to raise money for ATRA, the American Trail Running Association, largely to help support you know all of the U.S. athletes that get represented for uh, mountain ultra trail running and help you know contribute to being able to fund them, not having to come out of pocket to pay, pay to go to represent the U.S. in any of those races. That's a primary uh, focus on um, kind of helping raise money for that, but it's also going to support our local um, search and rescue and also um, the MS Run the U.S. relay 
which uh, our local representative for that this year is Liz Canty, who lives here and she's running part of that. So um, also a great cause, but it's just gonna be a lot of fun celebration of the community. And there's actually a race earlier in the day put on by uh, Era Vipa uh, called the Rock Hawk. So you could actually run and then you could come to the to the gala afterwards. It's a double win. It's a double win. It's a double win. Okay, that was our double commercial win. for we the episode. We have a special guest. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Oh, we have a special guest. Oh, got the Ready dog in. Ros Rosie wants to be a part of it. Okay, Rosie. You got it. <laughs> she All heard right. food and she was like, yeah, dad, we're going. <laughs> nice. That's, a, that's amazing. All right, Russ, you want to do the first one? Yeah. Okay. So you mentioned a ton of races that are going to be uh, live stream, but let's l give me your top three um, underrated races that are out there that you've, you've kind of got your eye on. JFK 50 miler is absolutely on the top of that list. Super competitive. I mean, it, it flies under the radar every year. Um, yep. I would say that I'd love to see, uh, silver rush 50 and Leadville 100. I think that's like a good tandem to do. Um, and then we're going to go, we're going to go outside the country. We're going to go to something different. And I'm going to say, uh, Gary Robbins, 100 miler in, uh, in yes, Alpine. British Columbia. is going to be, that's one that you might see mountain outpost at that. That would be a dream for sure. Wow. Cool. Love it. Love it. Okay. Okay. Next have... one is, uh, oh. give me a, go ahead, Corinne. Sorry. There was like a delay. Okay. All right, I'll do this one. Memorable. Do, what's your most memorable on-air studio moment? Most memorable on-air student moment was sitting. It was out of the studio. It was on the field, in the field. It was sitting um, on top of the escarpment as the runners were coming up. And I had an amazing, amazing sunrise behind me coming up in the valley. And I could see, you know, Lake Tahoe in the background. I could see the runners starting to make their way up. And uh, I knew how special this day is for so many of those athletes, so many of those runners. And uh, that one brought me to tears. That one, I was, within 30 seconds of being on screen, I was crying. So it was absolutely the most memorable one. Awesome. I think that uh, that covers the, uh, the, the, were you out on, were you at the escarpment, up at the escarpment? Okay. We're yeah. about, we were about maybe a hundred feet, 200 feet below the, a uh, hundred yards below the escarp. Awesome. Okay. Give me, you guys do a lot of like interviews during the um, live streams. Uh, give me like your Holy grail interview person. And what would you ask them? Oh, man, that's such, that's such a hard one. There's so many amazing personalities out there that I would like love to interview these people, like as they're, they're doing their thing. If I, if I were to have to say one person in particular, um, I would love, I would love interviewing Corinne Malcolm during a race. She's Ooh. already such like a fun bundle of energy. Uh, she would know how to riff like back and mm -hmm. forth. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously she'd be focused on her race, but I would love to like get in there and, and her Abby Hall is another like great personality. Um, Jeff Browning would be exciting because it's Jeff Browning and you never know what's going to come out of his mouth. And he's just like, <laughs> such a cool dude to talk to. I love him to death. Yeah. Those are, I mean, that was three. Those are probably be like my top three off the top of my head. Nice. Love it. Okay. Corinne, you want to do the last okay. one? Yep. All right. To round it out. This is the last one. Um, we need you to tell us your Mount Rushmore of ultra running media personalities. Ooh, explain that one a little bit more. So I think I get it. Okay, so not just ultra running personalities, you know, from an athlete standpoint, but people that are in the media, um, but you have to create a Mount Rushmore for our sport of those ultra running, those media personalities in ultra running. Ah, that's a solid question. I actually love that a lot. So if I were to build a Mount Rushmore and put my five prominent people like on the, on the stone, um, I would definitely say... Absolutely. Corinne Malcolm and Dylan Bowman. I mean, they kind of spearheaded this and they do such a great job with it. I would put Leah Yingling on there as an amazing field reporter who just knowledge and everything out there. Um, I would put, uh, I'd have to go with some behind the scenes people. 
And I would absolutely say that uh, I'd put Jamil up there for being the one who got the guts to invest and to push this and to make this a thing for not just one race, but for the entire, I mean, international races and country. I would definitely have to put Jamil up there for being the man behind the scenes, uh, making that happen. And honestly, last place would have to go to the last spot, not last place. The last <laughs> spot on the mountain would definitely go to uh, Billy Yang because, Ooh. you know, I think he was the one who pushed for this 2020, 2021, wanted to have that live stream up there, wanted to make things happen. And he did. And it's kind of because of all that, that we have what we have now. So those would be, those would be my top five. I'm sure there are awesome. so many others that deserve to be up there, but uh, that'd be my top five off the top of my head. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. All Love right. Them. Well, thank you so much for being on, on the, uh, the fire road uh, uh, episode of ultra uncovered. Um, appreciate you taking the time and uh, we can't wait for, uh, what to what we see uh, moving forward on on the mountain outpost uh, live streams? Yeah, everyone yeah, needs to go. Thank you so go much follow. for having me, guys. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, go follow Mountain Outpost on uh, on YouTube. Go for it, Corinne, on Instagram. You. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> there's like a delay. There's a crazy delay. <laughs> um, but yeah, go give them some love. And if there's anything else that um, you know people can do to help support these live streaming efforts, or if there's brands that you know, um, are listening to this by chance that want to get involved. Um, yeah, we'll put some information in the show notes. We're going to create those show notes about how you can help out. Y'all are so professional with your show notes now. Um, yeah, <laughs> thank you guys so much for having me. I appreciate it. You know, being able to talk about Mountain Outpost and what we're doing here and the excitement that we have for the future. Um, you know, keep your eyes peeled. There's going to be a lot of races that you're going to have access to being able to watch start to finish. Um, and a lot of great things going on the Mountain Outpost Network. So if anyone wants to support us, watch them, hop on the chats, talk about it, talk to your friends, share the links when we send them out. Like it's free, it's easy. We're not asking for money. We're not asking for donations. We're just asking for some help to spread the word. And uh, anything that you, anyone, not just you, I'm not talking to you two specifically, but everybody out there, if there's any way that you see we can make this better, like we're all ears. Come find us at a race or shoot us an email, shoot us a message, like however you can get a hold of us, however you want to get a hold of us. We're all ears for making it better. So don't hesitate to reach out. All right. Thanks, Zach.